Welcome to the Texas Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Corona, or the Duke of Debauchery. And right off the bat, I want to thank Mr. Jess De Hoyos from the Sons of Texas. He did that intro. And if you're interested in having your own intro, contact Jess De Hoyos. And he'll make a song just like he did for us here at the Texas Paranormal Podcast today. Interesting topic. Today we're going to be talking to Mr. George Salinas, and he did a documentary unlike any other documentary that I've seen, and I look forward to checking it out. Mr. George Salinas, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. I'm glad I finally got you on the line here. And give us a brief kind of background and your biography, and uh, tell us all about uh, yourself. I hate talking about myself, but I worked in gospel television for about 30 years. I uh, started out with Arnold Lee Shambach Ministries, and from there I went to Heartland all the way up to 2001, from 1983 to 2001. And this is the first time I got away from television and got back into it, and uh, now looking forward to having my own film this is my first film that i've done for myself i've been involved in filmmaking for a long time um and but this is the first one that i do my first project that's a, a project that's close to my heart which was about the events that happened in, in 1976 um but i come from the time of when we used to film with film and do everything on tape and of course now we do everything on computer so it's a little bit different but uh, in a in a nutshell, that's that's who I am. Um, I attended uh, Southwestern Assemblies of God College, which was a Bible school, and then from there, I went to University of North Texas and studied cinematography, and got into filmmaking. I've worked with uh, Dallas Sound Labs and people like that until I moved down here to the Rio Grande Valley, and that's where we are now. You know, it's interesting that the, the gospel background TV now is going to make. And that experience is going to help you with making this documentary on a cryptid. And we're talking about, for those of you that do not know, this is happening here in the Rio Grande Valley. Now, the Rio Grande Valley comp is comprised of the four counties on the southernmost tip of Texas. We're talking about Stark County, Willacy County, Cameron County, and the fourth one is, of course, Hidalgo County. Hidalgo, Hidalgo, Hidalgo County. County, of course, where McAllen is. So... This happened in specifically in Willacy County and also Cameron County, and you're going to do a documentary on a cryptid. Now, what motivated you? How did you get, I mean, this is a very different topic. How did you get motivated to do this? I've gone through several motivations and dismotivations. <laughs> yeah, it happens. On the subject. Yeah. My family was involved. And, and what happened, uh, it was something I never forgot about. I was 11 years old. In Raymondville alone, there was four attacks by the what we called, uh, what was coined as the big bird back then. And uh, the night that the one that talked to the media that was hospitalized, that night, my aunt, her son saw it, her eldest son, who... If you know him, he doesn't have a sense of humor. And later on, he became the manager of uh, the Houston Methodist Hospital, which is, at the time, I think was the largest hospital in the world. Now, this is your so cousin? Not a guy. He is your cousin? Is yeah. That, mm -hmm. and, yeah. He, and he saw it when he was in high school and ran home with him and his friends uh, and told his mom. And, then, of course, my aunt didn't believe him. Um, she doesn't have a sense of humor either. She's still alive. And she called my mom over because something happened a couple of hours later at night so my mom and i walked across town went to her house and um she told my mom that back then there was only i think channel four channel five and then the uhf channels and if you wanted good reception you put your antenna on a pole outside mm -hmm. and so the uh reception went out so she went outside to turn the antenna and she said she saw a man she's telling my mom this and she saw a man on top of it and that she tried to shoot the man and say, hey, what are you doing up there? Of course, all in Spanish. And she said, que se levanta la cosa. She said, all of a sudden, it stood up and opened its wings, flapped its wings once. 
the wind knocked her back. Didn't knock her down, but it knocked her back, and it flew off into the sky. Of course, I wanted to see it, you know, and she thought it was a demon, you know. So I bolted out the side door, out, out the kitchen door, and to me, she was old. She was probably like in her 40s, but to me, she was old. Sure. And I'd never seen an old lady move that fast, and she ran and got me. And If you or a family member have had an encounter with a cryptid like Bigfoot, dogmen, gnomes, or as we say here in the valley, duendes, or even a chupacabra, please let us know and write us an email. Could it be UFO or could even be you could share your near-death experience. Just write us at Texas Paranormal Podcast at gmail.com and that's all together. And make sure in the subject heading you write a short sentence telling us what the topic is. And I look forward to hearing from you. And at the last second prevented me from going outside. And she held me and she cried. And I only seen that woman cry three times in my life. She cried when her husband, my uncle, passed away. She cried when my mom, her sister, passed away. And she cried that night when she prevented me from going outside. Years later, when we're doing the research with uh, the gentleman that was attacked, one of my assistants, uh, Leanna, she said, hey, this is the spot where that guy was attacked. I said, yeah, this is the spot. He said, well, isn't that your aunt's house right there? I can throw a rock at it and hit it. And so if if I would have gone outside, I could have been the victim of it. Well, I told that story in cinematography class in 83. And we were called up to the front, and Dr. Olson was a really, really tough professor. And, and uh, said, you got three minutes to talk about a certain subject, whatever subject I give you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you down for two minutes, and you got one minute to defend it. And so he asked me, if you could make a documentary about anything, what would it be? And I chose that subject about the big bird and what happened in 1976. And I wound up talking for 15 minutes instead of three. And I looked up, it was concert seating, and I looked up at the wall, and there was a huge clock. And I realized I had been talking for 15 minutes and how hard a man he was. I stopped and I said, Mr. Uh, Professor Olson, I'm, I'm so sorry, I've, I've gone way over the three minutes. And he was hypnotized by what I was saying. So was I, so was the class. And it kind of woke us up when I apologized. He said, no, man, that's okay. Just finish up and then go sit down and I'll talk to you after class. Well, I thought he was going to kick me out because he used to kick a lot of people out. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, you, Mr. Thought, you thought here. negative, you thought negatively, right? He in a class that started out with 300, there was maybe less than 20 of us left after Whoa. the first week. Okay, because it was his last, it was his last semester, and he said, "You know, you're going to have it a lot easier. I'm the toughest teacher you'll ever have. Come next semester if you want an easier ride. But if you want to learn, stay in my class." And I was, I was dumb enough to stay. I and I was a smart student. And I barely passed that class, man. I barely passed. And uh, so, yeah, so he, I went to him afterwards and I said, Dr. Olson, I'm so sorry, man. And uh, he said, no, you're going to go on. You're going to, you're going to do good things. And you can tell you're, you're a smart kid. And he said, but listen, I want you to make me a promise. I asked, yes, sir. Anything. Just don't kick me out of your class. He said, promise me you'll make that film. And, you know, I was 18. I said, sure. Yeah, I'll make it. You know, without really thinking about it. I just wanted to, I you know, didn't want to be in trouble. And then I kind of forgot about it, like like I did everything else. Well, years later, when technology came up, this is decades later, he found me on Facebook, and uh, he sent me a, a private message. He said, hey, this is Dr. Olstrom. Uh, this is my son-in-law's account. Are you the same George Salinas that was in my class in 1983? And I said, yes, sir, that's, that's me. I remember you. He goes, hey, did you ever make that film? I said, no, sir, I didn't. And uh, cause, yeah, the, you know, you made me a promise. And I remembered, I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, well, you know, before I die, I'd like to see that film. And so, so here I am. And th now this is, the professor was from the University of North Texas, is that right? 
Yes, sir. And is so he's still uh, around as of today? Yeah, he's still alive. Of oh. course, he's retired. You know. Yes. He's all alive. So he called you out on your promise, and so he, he found you, and he's still waiting for that. He's still as mean as he used to be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, he's he's hunting you down like a bounty hunter. Um, and I was immediately nervous. As soon as I heard his voice, I was immediately <laughs> nervous. Right, it doesn't, matter like that, was it doesn't matter that you're older, right? You got afraid. It doesn't matter that I'm a man. I'm still going to be a boy to him. You know? Right, yeah. <laughs> the hair on your back doesn't matter to him. He's right. Uh, hey, <laughs> let's talk about. All right. So, how many attacks were there here in the valley? And they were not just in Willacy County. They were in Cameron County. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I have to I have to be careful. Okay. Because I I I kind of represent these people, and they've they've been through a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I don't want to give the film away, but in Raymondville alone, there was four. Whoa, there were attacks okay. in Harling- there were attacks in Harlingen. Uh, there were attacks in Laredo, Los Fresnos, Brownsville, um, and that's all I can say. Yeah, um, yeah. From as far as the valley is concerned, there were other attacks in Mexico, in northern Mexico. There was um, attacks San Antonio and other parts of Texas. Uh, some were kind of light. Some were. Um, very serious. Um, there's people that we've interviewed that still have scars. Uh, one one gentleman, he still has scars on his head when um, it broke through a window and attacked him when he was a child, and he still has the 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 marks on the side of his head. Now, everything in this documentary, did you personally conduct the interviews, or was there a team, or how did you get the information? Well, we've gone through three crews, um, and like everybody else that does documentaries, you know, you you build your, you know, your your mountain on the shoulders of others that have gone before you. Uh, certainly, the the work of Kim Gearhart, um, who's the world's foremost authority on cryptozoology. Uh, his research, um, he wrote a book or, or a series of books um, on cryptids. Uh, one of them being uh, a book called Big Bird. And uh, and he's in the film, um, and he'll be talking about some of the series of what it might or might not be. Uh, his work, of course, now Blackburn, uh, their work. But the majority of it, you know, just living, growing up in Raymondville, you know, a lot of those stories just came to us even after the the media stopped reporting it. The you know those stories didn't stop. The attacks didn't stop. And years and years, you know, you just kind of collect collect things and then we when we got serious about it and decided we were going to make the film then uh you know get a crew together and and you have your researchers together and and you go back and you look at uh some of the old media and old newspaper clippings and all that and just start talking to people and we've interviewed quite a few people have come forward uh 40 years have gone by and and a lot of the witnesses didn't want to talk to anybody that they talked to me. I really don't know why, to be honest with you, but mm-hmm. for some reason, people just feel comfortable talking to me. Um, I'm not sure it's the Christianity in me or, or what it is that sets people at ease or because I'm from Raymondville, but it was something that we all lived through and it was a, an awful time in our history. And, um, but they, they feel comfortable talking to me or they hear about it word, word of mouth or on social media. And, and they, they've come up to me and emailed me. Now, you know, we do get some wild stories that, you know, we know aren't, aren't true or some that we suspect that weren't true. And they wind up we're pretty sure this is true. Um, I've also worked in, in law enforcement uh, for 15 years and um, we follow the same rules of, of investigation with this as we would anything else like like we would a crime or whatever and some of the things that have been reported have been quite serious to where i've had to you know consult other investigators to find out what the statute of limitations um is and and all that further protection of the people that are coming forward a lot of the uh, go ahead no i was gonna say you know there's always um 
like the legend of La Llorona and the legend of this or that. Why is this, mm. for everyone out there, why is this different? Why is this not the legend of the Big Bird? How can, what do you want to tell everyone? What separates this from a legend? Well, like anything else, you follow the evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, in law enforcement, that's what you learn. You follow the evidence. It doesn't matter what people say. You follow the evidence. And as far as eyewitness, eyewitnesses, of course, they, the accounts vary, and people describe the bird differently, which lends credibility to it because if everybody described it exactly the same, we'd know they were lying. Um Everybody's going to look at stuff, you know, a little bit differently. But the just the fact that we went through it, um, and we all remember how terrorized our town was and how this interrupted our lives. You know, we were going along fine in 1975, and then uh, then at the end of 75, 76, all this started, and everything changed, and everything has been different, especially in Rainbow, since then. And because of that, it's something that most of us never forgot about. Now, some did, and there's a lot of aspects to the story. And as far as the difference between um, what happened with the Big Bird and La Llorona and all that, um, La Llorona and, and all those other legends, those are things that we kind of, everybody kind of, well, that happened to somebody else somewhere else. Yeah. But this happened to us. This happened here and it happened to us. We know people who went through it. We know witnesses. We have people that have scars on their chest, on their back, on their head. We have eyewitness accounts from people from all walks of life, from ranchers, farmers, police, law enforcement, DPS, scientists, teachers, people that if you were going to trial for murder and if they were on a, served on a jury they would make the jury and they could put you to death they could put you in jail for the rest of your life or you know you're in texas they could they could you know put you to death talking about cred- the- yeah credible witnesses credible witnesses now my engineer mr mark had a question go ahead mark what did you want to ask and, and what you're what you're saying about that about credibility and everything about you know what they've seen you can tell when the person's telling the truth and when they're trying to just tell a tall tale some of those that are telling the truth are are afraid to talk about it because it's an experience they're trying to forget and you know it's it's hard for them to talk about it am i am i correct yeah yeah absolutely um that's a good point um one witness comes to mind um we have these shirts for the film it's by her the rainbow terror and on the bottom, I, I quoted this one witness that, that said, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it looks like the devil. That witness, I had interviewed someone else that was actually a relative of hers. And he was talking about it around the dinner table. He said, hey, do you all remember our childhood friend George? He's making a film about the big bird. He interviewed me about, remember when I saw it? And he just saw it. And well, this girl who's a relative of theirs, you know, doesn't joke around. And I remember she was a, she was a coach. She's retired now, but she was a coach. And she said, you know, I saw it. And they all got quiet because, you know, she started crying. She was, I haven't talked about this in over 40 years, but I was driving down the highway. I was coming from Pan Am and, um, I don't know if it's still called Pan Am, but it was called Pan Am back then in Edinburgh. Yeah. But I was driving, and I see it's at night, and I see a bird eating a coyote in the middle of the road. And I'm like, that's the biggest bird I've ever seen. And so she starts honking at it, and it's not moving. And so she stops her car, puts her brights on, and she said it got up, and it was the biggest monster she's ever seen. And then look, it had bat-like wings. It had feathers. It had red eyes. It didn't they didn't glow like like they would in a movie or anything? But but she remembered it, that the, its eyes were red, and it jumped on her car. So she floors it, and it jumped on top of her car, and physically ran her off off the road into a cornfield. Um, and that's part of her story. I don't want to give her whole story away, but um, 
a guy driving an 18 wheeler happened to be coming by and and honked and scared it off and pulled her car out. But she was deathly afraid for 40 years because um, back then all the media uh, from television, especially newspapers, were were bigger back then than than television was, and all the newspaper articles mocked all the witnesses and said they were they were drunk they were hallucinating some said they were attacked by a pelican um the curator of the of the gladys porter zoo i think said that that it was a stork or something like that and so um so these people were humiliated and for that fear um a lot of people wouldn't talk um two of the police officers that saw it in San Benito, they had to quit their jobs and move away. The The victim that talked to the the media in Raymondville, he had to leave. He had, he, his wife divorced him. He had to move away. Uh, I think he moved out of the state because of all the ridicule that happened. So for these people to come forward, uh, it's a lot. Um, and of course, now we recognize things like PTSD, and a lot of these people have PTSD because they they went through something, and you know that's that's evidence that demands a verdict. Um, we started out making a lighthearted documentary, and um, we interviewed this one older gentleman. Of course, everybody's old now. And when we interviewed him, he was there with his three daughters and. And we had lights and sound, and we had a guy with a boom mic. And so I'm asking the guy questions, and he's telling us what happened to him. And he was one of the victims that was attacked by the bird. And one of our camera girls made a face. This is at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, she should have made it. He saw her make the face and he got very upset he got very angry he kicked us out he goes to his closet and he grabs a shotgun Damn. and so we're grabbing mics we're grabbing mics lights we're not we're not even putting stuff in cases and we're, and we're just you know running out the door you know in fear for our lives and as i was the last one and as i'm backpedaling out his front door you know his daughters are trying to hold him back you know in Spanish, he says, "You know, you think I'm lying." You know, I was, you know, and he takes off his shirt, and his upper chest is just hamburger. It's just hamburger, and we're all extremely sorry. And I went back the next day, and I knocked on his door, and he opened it, and had the shotgun with him. Yeah, and I'm scared to death, but you know, my father trained me to do what's right. And I said, sir, you know, I have your signature and we have the video that you gave us, but I want to do what's right. And I still live in this town. And I know I'll probably run into you at HEB or wherever. And if you don't want me to use this footage, I won't. And I'm, I'm so sorry about what happened. She's sorry about what happened. And he said, no, I don't want you to use the footage. I said, okay, fine. We won't use it. And we won't. But he still wants us to tell the story. Tell my story, but don't use my footage. And so we, we kind of ruined that for ourselves. But at that moment, we realized that we couldn't make a lighthearted documentary like pretty much everybody else does. And mm -hmm. so I talked to a few people like Ken Gearhart. And uh, and Ken was the one who gave me the advice. He said, well, you know, if, if we're going to make this film, we should really do it right. And really tell, finally tell the story how it really happened instead of the way it's usually depicted. Um, Cause the story has been told, told and retold, but it's never been told from, from our point of view and, and what we went through and, uh, and how it affected us and still affects a lot of people. And there's a lot, there's a lot to the story. It's, it's not going to be just a film. It's really a film about the people. But it's not going to be just a film like you usually see on like the History Channel or whatever else Ken's been on. Um, usually, you, you would expect just about the bird and what happened, and that's it. But this thing covers everything from 
uh, law enforcement, DPS, Texas Rangers, um, curanderos, Catholic priests, um, UFOs, UFO cults, um, America, Mexico, Rio Grande Valley, and beyond. Um, but for the most part, it's going to center around Raymondville. Now, we're here talking to, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows who you are. We're here talking to George Salinas, and he's talking about his documentary. I did want to verify, does Ken Gearhart come out in the documentary as well? Yes. I I was looking at his resume just so that everybody knows. A couple of things he's worked on, The Essential Guide to Bigfoot, A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. He's worked on uh, Big Bird, the The Modern Sightings of Flying Monsters. And encounters with flying humanoids, mothmen, man birds, gargoyles, and other winged beasts. So his resume, very impressive. George, let's quickly tell everybody what is the name of the documentary so they can kind of Google it and find it on the internet. What is the oh. official title? Sure, sure. Uh, we're going to call it Big Bird, but uh, we decided not to because mm-hmm. everybody thinks of Sesame Street. Uh, the name of the film is Pajaro, the Raymondville Terror. A lot of people up north have a have a problem saying pajaro. You know? <laughs> yeah, true, true. But uh, the reason we called it that was one of the victims that was hospitalized after his attack. He went into shock, and for two days straight, all he could do was scream the word pajaro. And so that's how it got its name, pajaro, the rainbow hair. Now, let's talk about what this thing looks like. I know different people had different accounts, but... Let's break it down. What what is uh, some of the commonalities when people destru- described uh, the big bird or pajaro? Sure. Well, that's that's the question. That's the question everybody wants to know. Besides, you know, when is the movie coming out? Mm-hmm. The some some people describe it as a a, a type of a, a pterodon, which is a, a pterodon is a type of pterodactyl. Mm-hmm. Most people describe it between anywhere between five or six feet tall to you know, nine, 10 feet tall. Most describe the wingspan being between 15 and 20 feet, just huge, uh, bigger than a car. Uh, most describe wings that were kind of like a bat, kind of similar to what the, the movie Jeepers Creepers mm-hmm. had, uh, veiny, uh, membranous, um, the face of an ape, uh, a beak. Some say the beak was translucent. Um, when it looked straight at you, you could see through the beak, and that's why it looked like an ape. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, it had teeth, had a tongue, um, <clears throat> they, made an awful noise. They did. So, you know, I was looking at the difference here, here the difference between a pterodon and a pterodactyl, just so that everyone mm-hmm. has kind of a heads up. So the pterodon is from the Cretaceous period, a pterodactyl from the Jurassic period, according to... The internet, the pterodon had no teeth. Pterodactyl does have teeth. Pterodon primarily found in the Midwest, Nebraska, Kansas, and the pterodactyl, and Africa and Europe. So it's interesting, as they describe it, um, that the uh, uh, most of what they're saying, it does fall into the category of the pterodon. Now, did you say that when they were describing it, um, that did everyone agree that it had claws like an eagle or how what, how did they describe the 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 feet as far as the, the talons um mm-hmm. most people described that had um three three talons in the front and one in the back uh the footprint that was found in Horningen, uh that's what it looked like and of course um we had uh, one of our researchers say was well, it because of the depth of the footprint and the size of the footprint, and I don't have that in front of me, but uh, he thinks it probably weighed something like 180, 200 pounds. Um, and it was you know, something large. Now, something as, as small and light as a, let's say, a, a tar- turkey vulture or, or an eagle that weighs probably like 70 pounds, 80 pounds, um, you know, they can pick up a goat and fly off of it. Um, so something bigger like that that has a that large of a wingspan could easily pick up a man and, and take him off. And those are some of the things that happened. Now uh, you did, as far as describing it, say feathers as well, like feathers. Yeah, um, 
I did want to ask you as well, and uh, you had mentioned UFOs. Now, where, did someone see a UFO, or how, how, where do UFOs fit into this? Well, I guess since you're from the Rio Grande Valley, I can you can be the first to, to know about this, I guess. Um, in 1975, before the bird sightings, strange things happened. Two DPS troopers were run off the road by a large UFO. And I was in November, the beginning of November. In mid-December, a huge UFO was spotted over Raymondville, moving slowly, making no sound. A lot of people saw it. And when I say a lot, probably talking about 100, maybe 100 people saw it. Right after that, all the stuff started to happen. All of a sudden, they were finding dead dogs, dead cats, half-eaten, and then the cow started to get half-eaten. The cow mutilation started, um, which is very expensive for the, the, the farmers and the ranchers. And that's when all the calls started going to the sheriff's office and to the police department. Uh, UFO calls. Um, and then the UFO signs just kind of stopped. And that was all in, in 75. And then in 76, the big bird sighting started. But in 75, that's when all that UFO, and there was a lot of activity over like a three week period. And then and then it was just gone for about five months until everything kind of stopped with the big bird. And then the UFO started again. Now, it's, um, it's uh, one of the things that people uh, what might be concerned about is, here you are already talking about something that's incredible a pterodon in, right. the, in the Rio Grande Valley. Did you have any hesitation? Mm. Like, maybe I shouldn't even bring up the UFO because it's already we're, we're, we're already asking them to believe one component. We weren't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to. We weren't going to include the, the UFO part at all. But we had enough people um, come forward and say, this is what I saw. This is what happened to me. Say, hey, I was a DPS trooper at the time. This thing ran us, ran us off the road. We had the Texas Rangers tell, tell us the same thing. These are people that, that don't lie. These are people that don't make up stuff. These people, that, they, they don't make up stories. Now, I've been in, in law enforcement for a while. Um, we're bound by the law. And that's what we're about. We don't, we don't make up stories. We don't make up lies because we can go to court. And we, what are we going to do? We can't perjure ourselves. You know, we're, we'll go to jail. We'll lose our careers. And so, these people don't don't make up stories. Texas Rangers don't make up stories, man. Yeah, so, you, when it that, comes to so uh, go ahead. Reason, for that reason, we're including it, and we weren't going to. And um, I did another podcast with, uh, which was uh, mainly about UFOs, and they kept trying to steer me back into the UFO thing. And um, they hated me because I stayed away. I stiff armed her and I stayed away from that subject. Um, <laughs> and then, a, then about a month later, you know, and we had you know production meetings about it and and arguments about it. You know, hey, you know, I don't want to include it, but but here's the evidence. What are we going to do? What are we going to tell these people? Yeah, I, I think you. Know, you we you did well by sticking to to the truth. I mean, if the truth is there, stick to it. I know it's far fetched, a pterodon and a UFO in a tiny town called Raymondville in Willacy County. But um, hats off to you. Now, one of the things that's tricky about a, a documentary and, and is special effects and putting how uh, how are the effects coming out in the film? I mean, are they are you, are they better than you thought are there exactly what you hope we're hoping for talk about the uh, the visuals in the documentary well like, like any filmmaker you're you're never going to be satisfied yeah um, that's kind of hard for me to 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 get across um without getting too technical um as far as the the animation of it um you know it'd be it'd be great if i could get the guys from from Disney or Pixar or whoever to come in and yeah, but it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm able to do some animation because that, that's partially what I did in gospel television. I did motion graphics. I can do a little bit, so we're going to have a little bit of it. We have a little bit of of um, of 3D animation with uh, with what we think it looked like. 
Uh, but we have uh, some fantastic illustrators. Uh, we have a couple of guys from from Nashville, uh, some local guys that have been doing the uh, the illustrations for us, and we've we've kind of released a little bit of that. Um, we don't release too much because you know we don't want to give away the film. But the uh, as far as all of the eyewitness accounts, uh, we've had at least two illustrators on each account, sometimes more, to illustrate what they saw. And, uh, and what they witnessed. Uh, and as far as the, the special effects, um, I did motion graphics for uh, Hero Fighting Championships, which is a mixed martial arts. <clears throat> it's kind of like a, it was a Christian um, UFC kind of thing. Wow. And, um, <laughs> yeah. We're here talking to George Salinas. Let's tell everybody where they can find you well, on social media. If people are want to follow you, where can they find you? Uh, well, we're still making the website. Of course, the website will be pajarotherainvoltera.com. We just haven't uh, haven't put it up yet. <clears throat> um, as we get closer to releasing the movie, we'll we'll have that up there. But you can find me on Facebook. As far as social media, you can find me on Facebook under my name, J O R G E Salinas. Um, and uh, on Instagram, I'm musician George, but George with a J, J O R G E. And there, I'm more. Uh, I publish more of the, the music that I'm working on. I'm a former musician um, and I got back into playing music so I could score the film. And, and I'm only doing that because because uh, music is very expensive. Yeah, save money. And so, <laughs> you know, Mr. John, yeah, so well, yeah, well, yeah. Mr. John Carpenter uh, scored a lot of his own yeah. uh, films, I believe. So you're in good company. Where are you hoping to release? Do you have a plan or you're not sure what you're going to, where is it going to be or what what have you? Uh, what are your leads so far? Uh, as far as distribution, mm -hmm. yes, um, sir. Well, we're going to do the the independent distribution run that most documentaries make. We'll start in Vail, Colorado, uh, at the Vail um, Film Festival, and then make the and then do the tour, do the the national tour with it. Uh, of course, we're going to be going international. Uh, anybody who follows us on Facebook. Has probably seen our, our shirts in in Spain and Italy and <clears throat> Luxembourg, Germany, Alaska. Uh, so everywhere you see that that shirt is where we're going, with the exception of the Vatican. Um, our shirts that went to the Vatican two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, but those doors are still kind of kind of closed. So we will be in Italy, <laughs> but uh, the Vatican is is a country in itself. Uh, but we had one of our guys who took a picture. Uh, with our one of our Pajaro shirts in front of the Vatican, so we just got to make that clear. We're not we're not going to be in the Vatican with our film. <laughs> I think I think I, and I think I know who the guy is. But eventually, uh, the, your website will be up, and we can anyone who wants to support the project can get a shirt there. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the, the shirts aren't really um, they're not like a a, a big deal. Uh, we did that because back in the day, back in '76, there were shirts. That said, Big Bird, and it had a picture of the of a pterodactyl on it, and uh, nobody can find any anymore. And so we just thought it'd be a, a cool idea. Uh, we had a logo made up for the film, and it's the same logo that'll be on. Uh, we're still undecided if we're going to have hard copy or not, if we're going to have actual DVDs, because that's just kind of going away. Uh, but we, um, the logo and stuff that we, we went ahead, we made some shirts, we made some caps, and um, some beer mugs, uh, root beer mugs for those who don't drink. There you go, yeah, um, and, uh, and and good stuff like that, just to to kind of keep the excitement, and, and people like stuff like that. If you or a family member have had an encounter with a cryptid like Bigfoot, dogmen, gnomes, or as we say here in the valley, duendes, or even a chupacabra, please let us know and write us an email. Could it be UFO, or could even be you could share your near death experience. Just write us at Texas Paranormal Podcast at gmail.com, and that's all together. And make sure in the subject heading you write a short sentence telling us what the topic is. And I look forward to hearing from you. And so uh, we don't make any money off them. It's just to, to get the story out there. Let me ask my engineer, Mr. Mark, did you have anything you want to ask? Well, I have an idea for you for that Roman thing. Uh, 
try the famous Trojan horse idea. That might just work for you, buddy. <laughs> there you go. So you got to sneak it in, all right? Yeah, well, the, the Vatican has the, the probably the best military in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with that. Mr. George Salinas, yeah. um, I want to thank you for your time. I look forward to this documentary. I know it's going to be great. And um, I know I've seen little clips because I've, I've seen that you've posted on your uh, social media a, a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, one more thing in reference to the actors. How has the documentary, has it been kind of easier than you thought or more difficult? Or how's the filming going? Uh, this has been the most brutal thing i've ever done mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um mostly because i'm paying for it yeah um i've always made films with other people's money um making films is very expensive um even a documentary uh no budget documentary scriptless documentary uh, is extremely expensive we actually myself and a couple of other people on crew we didn't have the money for anything and so we started out doing photography and we uh, said, hey, you know, we're pretty decent photographers. Let's let's do some weddings. And we we got booked for three years solid every weekend doing weddings just to buy the, the equipment that we needed to to make the film. So you know, we need cinematic cameras, cinematic lenses, uh, computers, uh, programs, um, you know, licenses for DaVinci Resolve, for color grading, all, all the stuff that comes with with making films and this isn't our only project i mean I, i've got two gospel movies that i'm also making um i have a movie called no one to keep me which is a, a gospel mixed martial arts film um and then I have another one called blinded by faith which is about my experiences in televangelism um so we're doing those projects as well uh, but pajaro the rainbow terror has been brutal as, as far as yeah, you know, I've had people try to sue me. Um, no one has threatened me the way they threatened the the witnesses, um, and some of them were threatened after the whole thing stopped. Um, and that's that's another story. Uh, now, no why why specifically me. were the witnesses threatened? Just because they didn't want the city of Raymondville to look bad, or what's the take on that? Well, it wasn't just Raymondville, but. Uh, the whole valley uh, a lot of people reported um, the whole men in black thing and here we go back to the ufo thing um you know they were some were visited and some felt sick <coughs> excuse me as soon as they felt the knock on the door um and some got terribly sick and some were told don't talk about this thing if you know what's good for you if you know what's good for your family um people in law enforcement were threatened um reports went to the to the sheriff, sheriff called the Texas Rangers. Um, not just because of the cattle mutilations, but because of the threats. Um, it was very serious. It was taken very serious. The, um, the, the issue is that it, all of this happened and then it wasn't, people didn't just get threatened, but people reported seeing the neighbor who was talking about it all of a sudden refuses to talk, talk about it, but he's driving a brand new truck. And it's paid for. Yeah, yeah. There's there's allusions to government involvement, um, police cover up, um, and now me working in law enforcement, you know, I had to tread very, very gently. Um, even as far as the witnesses, um, we had one witness that was kidnapped at gunpoint by her ex, thrown into the trunk of her car. He drove her out into a field, and he lets her out and points a gun at her, and he's going to shoot her. And all of a sudden, the birds show up out of nowhere and saved her, but attacked her. Um, and, of course, we want to focus on the bird attack. However, I being in law enforcement, okay, you were kidnapped. If you're kidnapped, that's, that, that's a life sentence. Um, so I had to look at the statute of limitations, you know, for reporting um, and all that stuff because someone needs to go to jail for a kidnapping. Um, so yeah. those are all very serious things that we have to look at, um, you know, when you're when you're making movies. And, you, and, of course, you have to get lawyers for distribution and all that good stuff. And then, 
you know, the arguments with Netflix and all that, um, uh, which unfortunately uh, that fell through. But uh, we're going to be releasing the film on Amazon Prime uh, as well as Tubi. But uh, Amazon Prime will be released, and then six months after that, we'll release it on Tubi. Hey, I'm glad you mentioned the Tubi. I saw I was on Tubi, and they have so many paranormal documentaries. And I thought, man, this is right up your alley. So I'm happy about it. Tubi is becoming a hub, a hub for um, for uh, independent filmmakers mm-hmm. that release this kind of stuff. Now, you know, about 4,000 horror films and horror documentaries come out per month in Texas alone. Wow. According to the uh, Houston Film Festival, um, which ours will be one of them. <laughs> but everybody that we talk to, uh, everybody from the South Texas Film Festival, <clears throat> Dallas Film Society, excuse me, Dallas Film Commission, Houston Film uh, Conventions and all that, uh, Vail, everybody that we've talked to about the film immediately gets excited about it and immediately says, hey, this is different, this is special, and it is, and we're, we're treating it with the, with the respect. Um, and thank you so much for, uh, for being so great about it and being so, so gracious. Um, I did this one interview uh, almost a year ago where um, the interviewer, in a pre-interview, um, said, you know, you should just make stuff up because I want to see the movie. And he was being very, he was very impatient. He said, you know, you should just make stuff up and finish it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we, we decided we, we couldn't do that interview. Good for you. Um, yeah. You know, I think you're going to have a niche uh, with Pajaro and then the gospel uh, MMA. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that combination of uh, uh, a gospel martial arts film. You're, you're, crea- you're creating your own genres. So hats off to you, George. Well, I'm, I am a gospel filmmaker. Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I am. Um, and that's, that's what I do. And Pajaro, the, the Rainbow Terror, I mean, I've gotten heat from it from both sides. I get heat from it from the paranormal people because I don't go into like the witchcraft. I mean, we do go into like the, some of the stuff with the curanderos. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't go into that. Of course, Ken's going to address, you know, the different theories of what it was, whether it was a demon, something interdimensional, a pterodactyl, a, a stork or, or whatever. Um, he, that's what he's going to do in the film. Yeah, people um, that are not familiar with uh, the Rio Grande Valley, we're so close to Mexico. We have the culture of uh, the curanderos, and uh, yeah, people are unfamiliar that it's you know still going on to this very day. Santeria, Santeria is very prevalent um, in our culture, especially down here. It was it was more open, you know, back then, and back then when all the in '76 when all that stuff was going on. You know, my parents took me to the Catholic priest because they wanted him to pray for me for, you know, because I was scared um, or they thought I was scared. And so when he took me up there, there was a line. And I mean, a big one to talk to the priest. And uh, he started referring people to to the curanderos. So maybe you should go talk to these guys. And so they took me to a curandero. And if I thought the line at the Catholic church was long, the line at the Coranderos, and there was maybe three or four in Raymondville back then that were known. And uh, and man, it was it was huge. I mean, they raked in they raked in some good money. I remember my dad giving them like twenty bucks or thirty bucks. And uh, yeah. uh, but it was a a lot of that was involved, and even even they were um, dumbfounded. They didn't know what to do, um, so they were casting spells and doing incantations, and and then. And we interviewed a couple of them and uh, some of the people that were formerly associated, associated with Dr. Q. Of course, Dr. Q was the one who, he was over people like um, Brett the Benedict and, and all of them that were on television. Um, I'm probably getting the names wrong. Um, but yeah, there's all of that. And so I, I get heat from that side and I get heat from the church. Um, so what are you doing involving yourself in this stuff? You know, I said, well, you know, when I became a Christian, I, I decided I was going to be honest because that's that's what Christ taught us. You know, He taught us to be true and honest. And if this is what it is, this is what it is. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. So whatever this is, it just is. And it doesn't affect my faith. It doesn't affect who I believe in 
or what I am or who I stand for. And that's all there is to it. And I'm just a regular guy. I'm a simple guy. You know, I love Jesus. I love God. And I want to continue making gospel movies and telling people about the Lord. I uh, love Jesus. I go to church when I can. <laughs> it's kind of tough these days, but um, but that doesn't stop me from uh, from making this film. But the the people that I, where I go to church now um, in Harlingen, um, they're they're really supportive of it, and so is my pastor, and and um, he knows my passion, and my passion is for making gospel movies. But um, everything that I do has a disclaimer. All my posters, all my contracts have a disclaimer. Anything that I produce or, or that I'm hired to direct uh, has my disclaimer. It says that the views in this film don't necessarily uh, represent those of George Salinas or Born Again Christian. It has to be on all my stuff. That's, uh, I want all that on there just so people can know that whatever I'm associated with is going to have integrity. Um, so I'm not going to lie to anybody. And I'm not going to lie about anybody. So anything that we put in Pajaro the Rainbow Terror, I hope that people will know that um, we put it out there because it happened. And that's the reason that we're making the film. We're making the film because we were there. We're making the film because it happened. And we just want to tell our story. Mr. George Salinas, I want to thank you for being honest, for making this documentary. I look forward to to seeing it. I know a lot of the people out there are, are looking forward to seeing it as well. Mr. Mark, did you want to add anything? No, I just can't wait for this uh, this to come out and check it out. Uh, I'm really intrigued by it uh, and everything you explained. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much. I'll get you guys some shirts and some uh, some passes when the when we do the local release. I'll make sure you guys are are taken care of. There you go. Hashtag winning. Thank you, Mr. George Salinas. <laughs> thank you for being our guest today and uh, stay blessed. And we're going to leave you with the music of a band called Lost Surf Vivers. And they made this music specifically for this podcast. And I want to thank Lost Survivors. So check out their music. And I'll leave you with my little saying, hey, do your part. And please help control overpopulation. Don't forget to have your children spay and or neutered.
Exodus Paranormal.